Hey everybody, welcome back to Stories with Sally and happy 4th of July. I have a very special story to share with you today and I think it's very appropriate since it is the 4th of July. Now I did want to talk just a quick second, just a little reminder of why we celebrate the 4th of July. Well, we celebrate the 4th of July because on July 4th, 1776, that is the birth date of Americans' independence from the British. And that is the day that the Declaration of Independence became official. So we celebrate this special event every year on the 4th of July. Now, the story I have to share with you today is a non-fiction story, which means it is real. It is not fake. It is a true story about real people and real things that actually happened. This happened a long time ago, but it is very interesting, and it has a lot to do with America's freedom. Okay, the title of the story is the true story of Mary Pickersgill and the Star Spangled Banner, Our Flag Was Still There. And it was written and illustrated by Jesse Hartland. And we have at the beginning of the story, you know, we always have the title page with the title and the author and the illustrator. And then we also have the copyright page. The year was 1813. Only 30 years had passed since America's 13 colonies fought long and hard for independence from Great Britain and we wanted to be free. But in 1813, we were once again at war with England, the world's most powerful nation. And the British were on their way to capture Baltimore, a thriving port city near the nation's capital. The British are coming. It was another muggy June day in Baltimore. There stood Major George Armistead, ready to lead American troops to defend Fort McHenry. In the days before internet, phones, television, and radio, messages were sent by flags. Ships communicated with one another by spelling out words with flags. Some wordless flags used images to convey meaning. George wanted to send a big message to the British. This land belongs to America. But who could make such a flag? It is my desire to have a flag so large that the British will have no difficulty seeing it from a distance. Lucky for George, not far away lived Mary Pickersgill. Mary had learned the flag-making trade from her widowed mother, who had also made blankets and uniforms during the Revolutionary War. By now, Mary was widowed herself. She owned and ran her own business, and she had help from her mother, daughter, two nieces, and an indentured servant. Were Mary and her team up for the job? It was a shop operated entirely by women.
Back then, that was very unusual. It's big and it's a rush. It's a big rush. Can you do it? Yes, we can. And they had just weeks to make it. The British were on their way. Day and night, night and day, the women worked together. Each tiny stitch was a small step toward a big flag and freedom from British rule. The flag grew and grew. When they ran out of fabric, more was delivered along with other supplies. And very soon after, how's the flag going, Mary? It's big, too big. The half-finished flag was moved. across the street to a brewery and the flag was finished in six weeks just in time for the British to retreat to the West Indies at summer's end. Chilly weather was coming. The new flag was hoisted over the fort anyway, but the war waged on and America was losing. A year went by. In the summer of 1814, the British attacked Washington, D.C. The Capitol was in ruins. The White House was burning, and the British were again on their way to Baltimore. Would they attack this time? Pow, boom, bam! Under a stormy sky at Fort McHenry, 16 British ships attacked, firing bombs and screaming rockets. American gunners returned the fire, shooting cannonballs and mortars. The wind whipped, the lightning cracked, and the thunder roared. The battle went on for 25 hours, and both sides were drenched. As dawn came and the storm pulled away, the flag peeked out of the clouds. The British retreated and the battle was over. The people of Baltimore awoke to see that their enormous flag was still there. They cheered. Yankee Doodle played. This land is America. We won. Hooray! Meanwhile, all through the battle and the following celebration, American poet and lawyer Francis Scott Key was detained in a meeting on a British boat. As the sun rose, Key saw the huge flag still flying over the fort and was inspired to write a poem in honor of the victory. The poem was set to a popular tune and became the lyrics to a song. After generations, the song eventually became our national anthem. What happened to the flag? Well, it became the property of George Armistead's heirs. For over 100 years, the old flag was occasionally paraded out, 
sometimes sniffed at for souvenirs and stuffed into a safe deposit box in New York City. In 1912, it was given to the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., where it was restored. Then it was crammed into a case where it was eaten by moths. More than 50 years later, in 1964, a new, bigger museum was built with a specially designed space for the flag. In 1996, a design team planned a new exhibit, which included a total restoration of the flag. Conservators carefully snipped off 1.7 million tiny stitches of the old cloth backing, cleaned it with over 10,000 sponges, and carefully attached a new backing. The flag at that point, over 200 years old, had a new home in a display case that controlled the light, humidity, and temperature. Today, if you go to the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, you can see Mary's flag. Have you ever seen a bigger flag? When you sing the Star Spangled Banner, remember Major Armistead and his wish for America to be a free country. Remember Francis Scott Key, who was inspired by this very same flag to write these words. Remember Mary Pickersgill and her can-do team of seamstresses. Boys and girls, I hope that you will, after you listen to this story, ask your parents to let you listen to the Star Spangled Banner so that you'll know and be familiar with our national anthem. I also wanted to spend a couple short minutes sharing some thoughts with you about America and freedom. Now, as you know, I'm a teacher, and I was thinking about how, for me, I see America a lot in my classrooms. Over the years, I've had a lot of different classes, a lot of different ages um, that I've taught, and in all of my classes, there has been a lot of great diversity. We all come from different places, different places in America. Some students I've had weren't born in America, but we were all part of the same class and we all were learning and growing together. We didn't look the same. We may have had different skin color. Our parents maybe have different jobs. We have different personalities and different beliefs, but in the classroom, we are all learning and growing together. And that's kind of what I think about when I think about America. I think about how on the 4th of July, it's important for me to consider how to be a better American, a better person in America. And oftentimes what I think about is how regardless of where people come from, what they look like, what their skin color is, what they do for a living. What I need to do as an American is I need to treat everyone with respect and kindness and most of all with love. We are so lucky to be living in this wonderful country, and I'll hope, I hope that you'll consider all these things that I've talked about, and I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July. Thank you.